22, verses 34 to 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is this, or the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me just grab this. Brilliant. Keep that passage open, please. Matthew 22. I'm just going to get organized here. And let's pray together. Father, thank you for your presence here. Thank you for your goodness to us, Lord, that where we gather together to worship you, you are here in the midst of us, and we, we love you, and we worship you. We want to um, grasp everything that you have for us. We pray tonight, Lord, that you would speak to us, you would um, encourage us, you would guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to be speaking today um, around the whole subject of abortion. And I want to particularly talk about um, breaking the silence that surrounds that. And that's going to emerge over time. And I just want to say, first of all, very many thanks to Jonathan Jeffs, who's there at the back. Jonathan is a friend of mine, and we've known each other for a long time. Jonathan actually has a little bit of a connection here, because some of the photographs that I use from time to time are aerial photographs. And he is a pilot, he used to um, pilot with the police, he now pilots for other people. And um, once I went on a mission with him um, a few years ago, and we went on a mission to Chorley Wood to um, hunt down these car thieves. It was very exciting. Um, we could see from two miles away the number plates, and we're getting them all down and so on. And then the, the second part of that mission was to go and hunt down some... Um, uh, some robbers who were kind of running around the roofs in the city of London, and we kind of caught them. You know, we could see them from the air, and we guided the police onto them. That was so amazing. And then the third bit of our um, a mission was to take some aerial reconnaissance photographs of Shadwell, and particularly of this church and our house. And so it was rather nice to have these aerial shots, and I've used them in many talks here. So, Jonathan, thank you for that opportunity. Probably shouldn't go to the police to see that, but um, <laughs> it's... Um, uh, it's great to have you here. And Jonathan is, um, has uh, um, years and years of experience in this whole area of helping people who have um, had an abortion, um, of kind of working through the issues surrounding that, but also um, in the whole area of crisis pregnancy as well. So I want to thank him for um, some of the contents of this talk and also the slides as well that um, he's done. So just looking at this passage, Matthew 22, this is where I want to start, and this is where I'm going to finish. Jesus, in summarizing the law, says in verse 37, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. So when it comes to abortion, what does it mean to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul? When it comes to abortion, what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? That's what I want to explore tonight. And I want to say right at the outset that I'm not going to ask people if they've had an abortion to stick their hands up to come forward for prayer at the end and we're going to lay hands on you. And you know, we're not going to do that at all, just so you know that. Um, because actually it does affect a lot of people in our society. It'll affect a lot of people here. Either we've had an abortion ourselves, we've been involved in that, or we know someone who's had an abortion. So um, we want to create a very safe environment tonight where we can think about this um, subject. And over the, you know, 40 years ago, abortion was talked a lot about in church in the 60s and 70s. 
But now, when you talk about abortion, well, if you ever hear a talk about abortion, it never talks about it. There's a silence in the church. And have you ever thought about why that is? Well, I think here are a couple of reasons. First of all, there's an absence of, I think, a compassionate response, an engaged um, and uh, theology that kind of makes sense for today. Actually, makes, is, is real for us. There's an absence of that. But also, alongside that, there's the presence of um, uh, like, a, like fear and shame and dissension. That's what causes the silence. And within that silence, there's an unhelpful and unspoken culture of judgment and condemnation. No wonder there's silence. So the aim tonight and today is to um, talk about this more openly, to break that silence. And I hope to do that with humility, with compassion, and helping us with understanding this subject. And why should we engage in this subject? Well, here is a statistic from the National Office of Statistics. 34% of all women in the UK will experience at least one abortion in their lifetime. That's why we're going to be talking about it. It affects people here. It affects people um, who we know. It affects our society. And so that's why we need to engage with this and understand it. That's why we need to understand the personal risks involved. If, if one third of people, women and men, men are involved in this as well, are involved in this, we have to uh, understand the, actually that we are personally affected by this. And thirdly, we need to manage those risks, both as individuals, but also as a church community. So first of all, I'm, I'm just in, in this talk, I'm going to look at understanding abortion. Then I'm going to look at what um, the scriptures say about it and the church, um, what the church says about it. And then I'm going to look at our response to that. And finally, I'll just touch on actually what we're going to do here at St. Paul's. So first of all, understanding abortion. Who has an abortion? Well, if you've got a stereotype in your mind about the kind of person who has an abortion, I want you to change that because abortion is widespread across our society. There's no one um, grouping in society that can be saying, you know, that's the group that have most of them. Actually, it's across every sector of our society, including the church, including amongst Christians. Most people who have them are, um, the, you know, the highest uh, number of people aged 20 to 25, but actually in other age groups, it's, it's, um, it's, there's not much difference. So why do these people get pregnant? Well, three things to consider here. First of all, the majority of women who go for an abortion believe that they were using effective contraception. Secondly, nearly 100% of people um, who have an unintended pregnancy have knowledge of and access to contraception. They know about it already. Almost all of them have used it in the past. So they're completely aware of, uh, of how to prevent it, if you like. And here's a third fact. 50% of all live births in the UK are from unintended pregnancies. So you roll these facts together and you begin to realize actually that um, we have a much higher risk of unintended pregnancy than perhaps we first realized. And we've got to understand that our ability to control our fertility, um, even if contraception is used, is limited. We think we can control it. We think we've got 100% control over whether, um, you know, the outcome of, of, of um contraception, but actually the statistics show otherwise. So why do so many women choose abortion? Well, most choose it fairly quickly um, on discovery of pregnancy, um, and their expectation is that they're going to return to the same place that they were before they became pregnant. 
So it's almost as if you know, there's a device that's going to allow a woman to reset um, her life into unpregnant. That's what many kind of hope for. And yet the crisis time of, uh, of being in, in a pregnant and you know, unexpectedly is that it's a time of fear, it's a time of panic. Um, there are these feelings of protection that um, can arise during pregnancy. And this is known as the head-heart dilemma. In the head, the head says abortion is the logical choice of an unintended pregnancy. And yet the heart says, um, you know, I, I long to give birth to this life that's within. It can be a terrible time for women. And although a woman can be in agony over the decision, she doesn't agonize over it because the head has power and it makes the decision. So what happens afterwards? What happens after an abortion? Well, it's complex. Um, some people seem to be okay after an abortion. Others, it's very different. But for many, not all, abortion can have a very unwelcome impact. Why is that? What causes these effects? Well, to create and nurture life, this is one of the most profound and, and uh, deepest instincts that we have as human beings. The woman becomes a mother. The man becomes a father. A new life has begun. The maternal instincts kick in. Um, even if she's planning to have an abortion, a woman begins to um, relate to those instincts that, are, uh, that she's aware of, just um, beginning to stir within her body. If you think about it, without an abortion, a child would have been born. And the fact is that an abortion is not a time machine. It can't turn back time. It doesn't take a woman back to where she was before she became pregnant. It doesn't make a woman as if she'd never been pregnant. She will always be a woman who has experienced pregnancy. When a woman first becomes pregnant, strong thoughts begin to emerge for um, the woman and the man involved. Some will have a clear sense whether their child was a boy or a girl. Um, sometimes out of uh, like an unconscious longing, there's a, there's a, a desire to name the child. Um, they have an idea of the color of its hair or um, his or her eye color. They may experience intense dreams uh, about the child in their sleep. One man who um, went on a post-abortion course said this. I was with a group of friends and we started talking about abortion. I mentioned that a girlfriend of mine had once had an abortion and someone asked, if the child had been born, how old would they be today? Without thinking, I answered, 12 and a half years old. The hairs on the back of my neck went up. How had I known that? If you'd asked me when my girlfriend had the abortion, I would not have known, not to within two or three years. I thought I'd forgotten all about it. Yet here I was, all those years later, knowing exactly how old the child would have been. And that conversation um, was the start of a journey of healing for that man who later undertook one of those post-abortion healing courses. Another friend told me of the abortion that she experienced. She said that she'd had a difficult time as a teenager, and when she was 15, she became pregnant, and she decided to have an abortion. And she said this, everything changed in my life. The shame and the grief I felt meant I had to separate myself from God fully. She'd been brought up to go to church. I believed I had committed an unforgivable sin and was going to hell, and there was no way back to his love. The years that followed were years trying to bury the pain I carried. I did well in my career. I seemed to, on the surface to be a carefree girl about London. However, the sadness and shame in my soul led me to be promiscuous, take drugs, and separate myself even further away from anything to do with God. And she learned to live with the pain. She said, it became so familiar to me, the pain, that I could not remember life without it. The sadness I felt for what I had done overwhelmed me at times so completely that I would weep at what I would never be able to undo. 
and she started going out with someone who took her to church. But she said she still felt detached. The truth was, I knew I had a dark secret and felt too damaged to become a part of it. I believed if people knew the truth about me, I feared I would not be welcome. These are the kind of experiences that begin to make a profound connection between a woman who is first pregnant and with that new life. And so for a woman who is pregnant, that pregnancy didn't begin at six weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks. It began when first, uh, conception first took place. So what's the Christian position on abortion? Well, you've got these two extremes. You've got, on the one hand, judgmentalism, where um, you know, they might use a scripture like, do not judge or you too will be judged. That's why there's silence. Don't judge others. And then the other extreme is a legalism that might use a scripture like, you shall not murder. And they use that exclusively and say, this is the principle that we're going to be governed by. On their own, neither are adequate. What does the Bible say? Well, whilst abortion is not specifically mentioned, the Bible is clear that abortion is unacceptable unless a mother's life is at risk. So just looking at some of these scriptures, Genesis 1, verse 31. God saw that all he had made, and it, God saw all that he had made, and it was good, very good. So physical life is described as very good in Genesis so physical human life is precious. You and I are precious to God. We are made in his image, and so we're precious to him. Genesis 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. So God here is saying that he forbids the taking of human life because Mankind is made in God's image. That's why, as Christians, we instinctively want to speak out for um, the preciousness of life, to hold on, to protect physical life. Exodus 20, verse 13, the commandment, you shall not murder. Psalm 139, I'm just kind of skating over just a selection here. Psalm 139, it's a beautiful psalm, um, which describes... Um, uh, something had taking place inside the womb. Verse 13, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my, um, in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So God's presence and involvement um, is, uh, is deep inside um, a, a little baby's life, inside the womb. This implies that that life is starting at conception, not some random moment at some stage during the pregnancy. And finally, Luke 1, verse 31, the angel Gabriel speaking to Mary, says, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. Jesus' life started when he was conceived inside Mary's womb. So the scriptures, just from this cursory reading, rule out abortion, either because a pregnancy is unwanted, it rules that out, or if a child is going to be disabled, actually that's not a reason for abortion either. Why? Because we are to preserve and nurture life. These scriptures also show, I think, that tests like um, amniocentesis, which is a test for Down syndrome usually, um, actually if it's um, in order to make a decision about termination, that's not right. We're to preserve and nurture life. What about church history? Well, the Didache is a set of writings, the late first century, early second century, a collection of writings of um, sayings um, of Jesus, but also teachings in the church. And the Didache says this, you shall not kill the child in the womb or cause a newborn infant to perish. 
And this value was kept throughout church history. So you look at the great theologians um, from the Middle Ages through the Reformation um, to modernity. They've all reaffirmed this basic biblical position from Augustine to Calvin, Bonhoeffer to Karl Barth, um, all affirming um, this biblical view. Um, bring it up to uh, modern day. Um, in the papal encyclical, um, Evangelium Vitae, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, John Paul II, the last pope, um, declared that the church's teaching, Catholic church's teaching on abortion, is unchanged and unchangeable. So throughout the ages, Christians have held to this biblical position that life begins at conception and should be protected and nurtured to birth. So what about the church today? Well, today, over 70% of Christians think that abortion is okay. So there was a poll that was done um, in 2010 with um, a group of Catholics and um, over three days, and they measured it, and 69% of Catholics um, think that, uh, today, think that abortion is okay. So something has massively changed. There's been a swing. There's been a turnaround. What has gone wrong? Well, as we unpack it, I think one of the main reasons is that um, for most people, a traditional theological view of abortion actually fails to speak compassionately to someone in a crisis or someone who's had an abortion. It focuses very much on the um, unborn life rather than the person in crisis. And people today view abortion as a, as a compassionate response to an unplanned pregnancy. So therefore, if you challenge it, if you condemn a woman or a man who's been involved in abortion, it seems judgmental. It's, um, it feels bigoted. And arguments about when life starts just feel academic. They, um, they just don't really connect with us personally. That's why it feels uncomfortable to speak about abortion in church. That's the root of this silence. And in this climate of silence, where the majority don't speak, extremism has a voice. No one's challenging it. So you've got extremist um, groups within um, the Christian uh, arena who are campaigning against abortion and can be saying some very hard, horrible things to people, which doesn't feel very loving. And that becomes the view, the default view of everyone else's view of what the Christians think. And so even more, that increases the silence within the church because we don't want to associate ourselves with this extreme view. We don't know what to say. And so it reinforces the silence. Many Christians think that actually the, this silence and a refusal to engage with the subject is compassionate in itself. But actually the reality is that this silence covers up the problem. It actually stops people who need healing and need to address the, the huge deep issues that are going on after an abortion to actually receive healing for those things. And it actually stops other Christians um, from thinking about um, the process that leads to an abortion. It stops them thinking about it in advance because no one talks about it at all. I think as well it leaves these extremist groups unchallenged in the way they use their language insensitively. So what is the right response? What is the right way of addressing um, abortion? Well, in this vacuum of silence, we need to reinvigorate our theology, to have a, a theology that's compassionate, that um, particularly takes um, account of those who are personally involved in this. So back to Matthew 22. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. How do we do that with this issue? Well, I think, first of all, loving God, being a disciple who wants to follow God and give ourselves to him, it, it means making a decision that we want to go God's way. 
So I think we need to resolve as Christians not to have an abortion ourselves. And to be intentional about the way we live that out in practice. So given the prevalence of abortion in our culture, one third of people will have been involved in it. We must be, we must be intentional. Otherwise we'll just be swept up in circumstances. How can we do that? Four quick things. First of all, we need to understand that it's a personal issue. We need to understand that I'm personally at risk. If you only assume that abortion happens to other people or this little grouping or something like that, we're, we're planning to fail. We need to realize that abortion happens to people like you and me. We need to get personally involved in this. So we need to think through the issue for ourselves. How would we respond in a crisis? Either in our own lives or with friends or family. We have to address it. We may be tempted by um, a bad set of circumstances that we fall into ourselves. We can be influenced by the many who are around us who um, would say, actually, this is the normal course. You should have an abortion. We need to think that through in advance. We also need to understand that in our society, we have a highly institutionalized um, nature of abortion. The medical professions will assume that an abortion will be wanted if you have an un unwanted pregnancy. So if that's the case, we need to be intentional. We need to realize it affects me personally. At the same time, we need to let God's grace abound in this decision that we make. It's very easy to judge other people or to come across as condemning other views when we've taken this view ourselves. So we need to grow in grace in our own lives. We need to um, ensure that love and compassion forms the basis of that decision in our own lives. It doesn't mean staying silent but it does mean using sensitive language when we speak about it. We're personally involved in this. Secondly, we need to realize that our ability to control our fertility is flawed. In a lab where contraception works 100% of the time, great. I have to tell you, this might be news to you, sex is not a lab. <laughs> it just doesn't happen that way. And the statistics bear that out. 50% of all pregnancies are unplanned in the UK. Half of all pregnancies in the UK are unintended. That's an extraordinary statistic we just have to get to grips with. So... What are you going to do about something that's unplanned? We love to control things and plan things. But actually, do you know something? All the statistics say you don't, have, you don't have that kind of control that you think you do. We need to be aware of that. Let's be intentional about that and walk into um, uh, relationships with that in mind. There are consequences. We cannot prevent conception 100% uh, uh, of the time. And so let that influence your decisions about uh, your sexual relationships. So, of course, we want to affirm and reaffirm the basic biblical position that sex is for marriage. That's what we want to affirm again and again. That's, that's what we believe, believe the Bible says. But the reality is that whether it's happening here or elsewhere, people will have sex outside marriage. So let's just be aware if that's you, be aware that there is a strong chance that you will have an unintended pregnancy. Just be real about that. So men, in particular, I want you to take responsibility for this fact by your actions. It's personally involved. Secondly, um, we said about we can't control our facility. Thirdly, um, I want to encourage us to have open discussions with partners. So at the start of a relationship, people often discuss um, about birth control. They'll talk about contraception. But how often will you talk about what happens if you have an unplanned pregnancy? I don't think that ever happens. 
Yet it's important to face the fact that that needs to be talked about. And that gives an opportunity to explore values about why you're doing what you're doing, about when you want to do um, these things and what you might do. What might you do if you're faced with an unwanted pregnancy? Um, in marriage, what will you do um, when you're having a baby? You'll be presented with a choice about having um, uh, things like that, amnia and, uh, um, and thesis um, uh, test. What are you going to do? Think about it before you have that. Tests for fetal abnormality are normal. Think about it before it happens. It will, if you think about it and talk about it, it will prevent so much heartache in the future. So, women, I want to say to you that if a guy says to you, I'll do whatever you want to do, if there's an unplanned pregnancy, I think behind that statement sometimes will be a, um, actually, I want you to make the decision and I want you to have an abortion. So flip it around and say, actually, do you really mean that? Let's explore that. What do you mean by that? Would you support me if I had a child? We need to take responsibility for our actions. Fourthly, we need to be informed about adoption. Because adoption, in this country, adoption is, quite, is seen as a little bit of a negative thing. But actually, it's the most wonderful thing. We've got some friends who are um, going through an adoption process at the moment. And it's a wonderful thing for them. It's going to be a wonderful thing for the children that they're going to adopt. Of course, it's difficult for a mother to relinquish her child to another. But it's... It's worth thinking through the consequence of that. We need to have a positive view of adoption because it saves the life of the child and enables that child to be brought up in a loving, nurturing family where they're able to help where the other person might not be able to. And statistics show that the outcomes for adults adopted as babies are on a par with those brought up in birth families. So it's a, you know, we need to be informed about a positive view of adoption. So finally, let's get practical. What are we going to do here at St. Paul's? If we're taking this view that um, we, we think that abortion is not right, that it's wrong, but that we want to break this silence around this whole subject, and we want to do something about it that reflects this command to love God and love our neighbor, what are we actually going to do here? What are we going to do as a church community? Well, the first thing is we want to create a healing community. We want to be a community where people can experience the love and tender compassion of our God here with us. I just want to tell you the rest of that story of this friend who had an abortion. She heard a talk rather like this one in, um, at HTB. And she, um, the talk was about uh, a post-abortion healing course. And she said this, my attention and my heart opened. In that moment, I felt my tears run down my face and I was overwhelmed with the need to do the course. When she arrived at the course, she said she was literally shaking. She was so nervous. However, she said this, I was warmly welcomed by the leader and introduced to others who were attending. This helped me to relax a little as unlike what I had believed, I was not the only one. And she said this, the course is a bit like a journey. We looked at anger, grief, responsibility, forgiveness. I never realized how much pain I was carrying inside me. The course helped me to explore so much about my situation that I'd never seen before. I began to understand that others had played roles in my final decision and how alone I'd been at such a young age. I remember when we discussed forgiveness and how through all the tears I saw how I had punished myself and how broken I had been. But with the loving support of the leaders and many prayers, I was able to ask for forgiveness and truly came to believe that God had forgiven me. And finally, I was able to begin to forgive myself. The course helped me to begin to slowly build a relationship with the loving God I now understand him to be. A father who wants his daughter to be free from shame and grief. A father who loves me and always will, no matter what I have done. I am truly grateful that the church had the courage to hold this course. It gave me a lifeline, a way back to God, and way to live at, um, without brokenness anymore. What I did will never change. And there are days when I still feel a deep sadness. However, the difference is now I bring it to God and ask for his love to help me through, which he always does. And she said this, I would encourage any woman who has had a similar experience to go on the course Remember, God has always and will always love you, 
no matter what. And we want to enable Christians who have experienced an abortion to be able to think clearly about the past, to lay it before God, and to find peace in their hearts over this issue. Abortion is not the unforgivable sin. And I encourage everyone who may feel that they've got unresolved difficulties in this area to seek um, help in talking these things through. Abortion can be so corrosive to faith. And our experience is that Christians who go through a structured healing process can find a new faith and a new walk with God that is transforming. I'd love to just invite um, George. George, whereabouts are you? George, please welcome George Sherb um, from the morning service normally, but let's give her a big welcome. George um, has been involved in um, post-abortion healing courses um, for a number of years, and she's going to tell us about, um, about here. Yeah. Brilliant. Hi. It's very nice and quiet at the evening service. Um, yes, as Rick has said, basically... Um, I've been involved in Care Confidential for quite a few years now who actually run courses like these across the country and also at Holy Trinity Brompton who uh, also do the course that we're hoping to do. Um, as Rick said, basically some women, not all, but some do maintain a really strong connection with a past abortion and that can go on to lead to an awful lot of difficulties later on which is why it's been amazing to see the need to address it and just how helpful the course can be in, in working through that. So um, I'm going to basically go through some details of how the course will run. Also, just look at how you can help, if that's right, or what's involved if you'd like to attend. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say, I know I'm very biased, but it is a, a brilliant course. Jonathan, who's over there, has spent a long time developing it, and um, I've helped on them and just seen quite how so many people have literally said it has been life-changing for them. I've often spoken to people that, for example, have had nightmares for years following an abortion and then halfway through the course they'll just stop. So it's just amazing to see how, how great that is for people to work through. Um, just to get through to the practical details, just to give an overview, in some ways it's like an alpha course, so it will be in small groups, we'll start with um, eating together, then there'll be a short talk, then there'll be a chance to discuss the talk, to work through some exercises to explore that evening's topic and then you'll pray together. There will be eight sessions, uh, mostly on consecutive evenings, so like Tuesday evenings or whatever, and then one Saturday. Um, in terms of timing, we're looking at building up a team over this term, and then next term in the autumn we'll do some training, which will probably be for quite a few other churches as well in London, um, and then we'll plan to start the course the following term. So I appreciate it's quite a long time lag. Uh, trying to think what else I was going to say. For, yes, if you think it's something that you would like to help with, then that would be amazing. At the moment, there's myself and Becky Ham. I don't know if you know her from the morning, um, morning service. Yeah. Uh, please feel free to speak to either of us if you've got any questions about it at all. And as for Alpha, we would need some helpers, so people to sit in on the group, just to, not to have to contribute, but just to get teas and coffees, make everyone feel welcome, that kind of thing. We'll need some help with catering, so a, a meal would be amazing, or say to cook some cakes or brownies. I think I said in the morning course, we find that people like to eat a lot of chocolate and things through the course. It seems to come in quite handy at particular moments. Um, and also prayer support, which is really important. Um, I've worked at quite a few care confidential centres, and at every one it's become very clear quite how important the prayer side of things is. So if all you can commit to is maybe to pray once a week, that would also be amazing. And I'll probably send out emails each week with pointers for the, that particular week's talk or um, what it is that we'd like you to pray for. Uh, just, I forgot to say, this is a flyer, it's at the back. It's got an email address on it and um, some further details. So if you'd like to attend or you'd like to help, please do pick one up. Uh, what else was I going to say about helping? Um, if you'd like to attend the course, the first thing I'd like to say is that I know that that does take a lot of courage. Uh, they did a survey at HDB a while ago in terms of what, how many leaflets the average person took before attending the course, and the average was seven. So I know that it takes a lot of courage to actually look at something that you might have buried for years, 
possibly. Uh, but I would say, unfortunately, we're not quite as large as HTB, so we can't run the course as frequently. So if this is something you think would help you, I'd, I'd really encourage you to pluck up the courage and register, um, just because, yeah, then we can have the decent group size for each course. Uh, the other thing I wanted to really stress is how seriously we'll take confidentiality. So, for example, you can register anonymously. There's an email address on here which will go directly to me and won't go through church. But if you do want to call the church office, they'll also be dealing with everything very confidentially. Can't say that still. Um, and we certainly wouldn't discuss the course in any way outside. So if I bumped into you in church, we would, I would never you know, talk about it. However, if that still feels too close to home, but it's something that you know you benefit from, then I'd really encourage you to go on a course um, elsewhere. As I mentioned, Care Confidential run them, and there's several really good centres uh, quite close to us in London. There's a, one at Westminster, and there's one at Playstow. And Playstow, you can, um, you can do that. It's slightly different because it's a one-to-one -one course. And I would say that because it's aimed at everyone, not specifically at uh, Christians. So there's a couple of things. A, it doesn't deal with things like forgiveness in quite the same way. And it can be really helpful to be in a, a church context for that. The secondly, second thing is obviously it's not in a group, which again, people have said they found the group um, context really helpful. They've been running it for about 20 years at HGB in a group, and, and that's been the feedback. Uh, I was also going to mention... Uh, guys, yes, I know generally when we talk about abortion, it's quite easy just to focus on the women. But, I mean, in most cases, it is a joint decision, um, and men can be affected just as um, much as women, and often even have less people that they then go on to talk about it to. So, we would love to offer a course for men at some point in the future. I think it probably won't be the first thing we're able to do, but... A, if you'd like to help and you're a man, it would be great if you could still email about the training. B, if you would like to attend something soon, um, we have access to a, a men-only group, which is running elsewhere in London. Or you can do the one-to-one. -one. There's some great male advisors who I know at other care confidential centres. So again, if you use the flyer, you can just email me on that and I could recommend you some options. Um, and I think the only other thing I was going to say is, even if this is something that's never affected you, I would just ask you to take a few minutes to think that it definitely has affected a lot of your friends and family, even if you're not aware of it um, at the moment. So if it does come up, it would just be great if you can really think about how you would handle that conversation and also if it's applicable to recommend this course if you're at St Paul's or there's other, as I mentioned, courses you can do or they can do and um, you can always email me for any suggestions or just go straight to the website of um, Care Confidential. Mm. Thank you That's George massive. very much indeed. Let's give George a massive clap. <laughs> it's so amazing um, to have um, you know, George and Becky who um, feel very cool to be able to provide this at St Paul's and um, it's a great blessing and um, just a couple of things just right off the back of that. One is, um, please do take a leaflet, you know, if you know someone else who, who you might like to give it to. And the other thing is, I think that actually even tonight, God will have been stirring in people a desire to help with this. And um, uh, whether you've been involved in a previous abortion or not. So, um, you know, it was something like this, that um, Jonathan just had a, a deep calling from God to do that. Same with um, Becky and, and with um, Georgina as well. So um, just respond to that and maybe get in touch with George to say, I'd love to help in some way, I'm not sure how, but um, let that conversation start. I want to come into land by using a civil aviation authority illustration, which is that... Um, Pilots, um, when they are, um, if they make a mistake, we kind of want to know about that, don't we? Yeah? If a pilot makes a mistake, we want to make sure that something is done about it or that, you know, that it's not done again. And so there's a, in order to create an atmosphere where pilots are going to actually respond in the right way, they've, um, they've got this thing called safety management system. And it's, it's where they have a just culture. And the just culture is about reporting errors that happen uh, so that you're not going to, and you won't be punished for reporting that. And so the way they phrase it is this. The just culture is where individuals are not punished for actions, omissions, or decisions taken by them which result in a reportable event. 
And it does say, it goes on to say, however, that gross negligence, willful violations, and destructive acts are not tolerated. So it's not you know, that kind of side of things. But they just want to create this reporting culture where people are happy to talk about things that go wrong. And I think that would be really good to have here at St. Paul's, a just culture where we're able to talk about things that go wrong in our lives, where we're going to be free from condemnation. We're going to be free from people making judgments about us. But where we're able to respond together as a community with compassion and with love, not judgmentally, not with legalism. Um, do you remember those extremes, the judgmentalism, you know, I, I'm not going to say anything, versus legalism, you shall not murder. Actually, we want something in the middle that is more like family. In a family, we look after each other. We have compassion for each other. There are enough people in the family for different gifts to emerge, different um, resources to be used, people to be able to take responsibility for, um, say, for children if another's not able to look after that child. That's um, a just culture where it's like a family. That's what we want to encourage and, and pursue. We stand alongside each other in a family when we face a crisis, when there are difficult choices to make. We want, don't want to leave someone alone. We want to stand alongside that person and say, I'm going to help you to make this decision. That means helping them to be courageous about the future, about the consequences of that, but you're not going to be left alone. It might mean that someone says, actually, I want to go ahead and do this. I want to go and have an abortion. And actually, we don't want to just leave someone isolated in that situation. I want to say, actually, I'll, I'll be with you. I'll walk with you in that circumstance. That's challenging. But if we're clear about the fact that abortion is wrong, we have a strong sense of that, then actually in the family we're able, from that position, to be able to stretch out an arm of compassion and say, I love you in spite of the choice that you're making. I don't reject you on that basis. We need a theology that is compassionate, and engaging with real issues, real life. Another thing I just want to say is that, you know, there aren't many single mums in this church. And um, there are not many pregnant single people in this church. And do you know something? With these statistics, there should be. We need to be a place where those people are welcomed, not judged, they're welcomed where we say, do you know something? We want to walk with you and stand with you. We love you. We're not going to judge you. We're going to welcome you. Like we were praying in the, the prayers earlier about the prodigal son returning to the father who had massively sinned and walked away from God. But he was welcomed by a father who embraced him. I think that's the beginnings of what it means to love our neighbor as ourself. So back to Matthew 22. What's the greatest commandment? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Loving God with all our hearts and soul and mind means um, being a God lover and saying, I'm going to resolve in this issue not to have an abortion. I'm going to intentionally live my life out so that I consider that it's a personal thing, that I'm personally at risk, that um, I need to um, think that con contraception is not foolproof, that um, I'm going to have open discussion with my partner. I'm going to um, see adoption as a, as a great um, positive thing that is, that is out there. Loving God. And I'm going to love my neighbor as myself. I'm going to um, choose to be part of a healing community that welcomes people who are in crisis. I'm going to be someone who is prepared to um, give up that time and energy and um, sacrificing some of the things that I would prefer to be and to walk alongside that person who's facing those difficult choices and say, I'm going to stand with you. I'm going to uh, enable this to be a healing community where you can find healing from mistakes and decisions that you've made in the past that um, you regret. We want to be an open and loving community, loving God, loving our neighbor. And we're a community like that, people's lives get transformed. 
And that's the kind of community we want to be a part of, isn't it? So let's pray. Father, we love you. We recognize the silence that surrounds this whole area of abortion. And Lord, we are sorry for our part in maintaining that silence. We pray that you would help us as a church and as individuals to choose you, to choose your ways, to choose to say no to abortions, but to do that with compassion, with humility, with understanding. And we pray, Lord, that we would be a community that grows and learns how to love those who are in crisis, where it's okay to talk about it. It's okay to um, bring it forward, where we can face the crisis together. Come, Holy Spirit, we need your power, we need your strength, we need your love to abound. In Jesus' name, amen.